never, <laughs> I've never spoken in front of this many people. Um, I brought my tissues ready because it's a very uh, sensitive topic, especially with what's going on. I just haven't been able to sleep for days. It's just really, really heartbreaking. Last class, we did a show on the role of the Jewish woman, and then I said it's a perfect transition because then we could talk about Shalom Bayit and you know how to have an amazing marriage. And I said it's important, but it's not as important as talking about Emunah and Bitachon, especially with what's going on nowadays. So this show, of course, is dedicated to all the victims, the families, um, the people, hopefully, that will find alive. Um, dedicated to good news, really, that Hashem has mercy on us and that, first of all, we have Mashiach soon, but that we, we really have good news this week. Especially with this weather, I think it's slowing things down, but there's a lot of Hashem, you know, Hashem can do any miracle in the world. So, you know, we can't, we can't lose hope. So, that's very important. Um, I want to just mention, where's Jessica here? Uh, that she sponsored the sushi. Thank you so much. It's amazing. And Sivan brought cookies. So it's really so nice to get messages like, I want to sponsor this class. And I'm like, well, we already have someone sponsoring in another two weeks, but you can sponsor the next, you know, in the next three, three classes you can sponsor. Like there's just so many um, people reaching out, wanting to sponsor the shul. There's so much unity, which is really, really touching and so beautiful. And I'm, I'm so happy that you guys can make it. So we're like we said, we're dedicating it to all the fallen, the fallen victims and, and the families and Bezat Hashem, may Hashem give them strength because it's really not uh, not easy. When I first started teaching shirim, I don't know if you guys know, I, I started doing shirim three years ago. This was like around the time I was dating my husband, um, and it was only for teenagers. And that's when I realized, wow, like I have an ability. Hashem gave me the ability to string words together and inspire people. And you know, there were some teenagers that I was like, oh my God, like I'm so worried, like if they look on their phone and they're gonna be bored and this, and not one person looked at their phone for the entire hour. And you know, teenagers nowadays, they're like on their phone like every two minutes. So it was really beautiful to see, but I was like, I have the ability to use those words to empower people, but there are times that, then there are tragedies like this that I don't have enough power, I don't have the right words to string together to even talk about what happened. Um, like I mentioned, it was really, really hard for me, um, like mentally, to, to see how surreal this was. It was really just a really, really not... When my husband showed me the video, like I, I was like, obviously it's Photoshop, like it's not real. And he was like, Sean, this just happened. Like we had went to dinner, we like went home, and then the next morning we woke up to the news and I was just, I was like, I can't, I can't imagine them sleeping and then everything collapsing. It was just not real. And it's just tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. When we look at the past few tragedies and the past three months especially, there was three main ones. The first one was the collapse of Meron. Uh, which was in Nag Baomer when people went to uh, Meron for the um, the gravesite of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. They did the big Ilula there. And a lot of people died, kids died. It was horrible. That was the collapse, number one. Number two was Shavuot in Givat Ze'ev. There was um, thousands of rabbis singing to Hashem and in the middle of the tefillah, the few benches at the back just completely collapsed and people died there too, right? It was very, very close together. And now this, the Surfside Collapse, and we see a theme in all of this. It's not like different tragedies going on. It's the same things that are happening. It's collapsing one after the other. When I think about these events, it's never been so clear to me that Hashem is telling us to wake up and to understand that a specific collapse means that the foundation is broken, right? So physically we saw the collapses, physically the foundation was broken. There was something that was wrong with it. And so everything collapsed, right? It's one thing after the next. There's no such thing as coincidence, right? That's part of Emuna. And I really, really believe that. Like every single detail in your life, every single thing is for a reason. And now Hashem is speaking loud and clear. Your foundation is broken. 
When we look at society today, our Jewish foundation, our primary foundation, is completely broken. It's lost its value. People lost faith and trust in Hashem. Social media is how we evaluate ourselves, how pretty we look. We go to celebrities and that's how we evaluate how we should dress. Homes are becoming broken. Couples are not getting along. There are divorces left and right. Kids are being taught the wrong things in school and now they're pushing even a worse agenda. Every single thing that's important to the Jewish foundation is broken, right? It's, it almost seems like it's a bubble. There's, there are illusions here and there and we're falling in the trap. We're not realizing that we need to wake up and Hashem is sending us direct signals and people just keep going on with their days like everything is fine. You know, like people are gonna talk about the suicide collapse for the next month, two months, and then people are gonna keep doing what they're doing. But, and that's why Hashem keeps ha having to send us signals because we're not responding. We've even become desensitized to common, common things like kindness. And I'm gonna give you an example. There are a lot of videos that sometimes like pop up on my Facebook and they show like when somebody, you know, went on an act of kindness and helped someone with an old lady with her grocery bags and they get millions and millions of views. We're getting millions and millions of views for things that are random and, and simple acts of kindness that aren't necessarily extraordinary. And we see it as extraordinary nowadays because it's so rare, right? Everyone's so focused on themselves, so focused on just me, my family, we're in this bubble that Sometimes we forget to help other people. We forget to do chesed. Like it's missing so, so much in the society. And we don't realize sometimes that we need to do more kindness. We need to be more generous. We need to be more selfless and go out and help. And so we live in a society where human kindness and selfness, selflessness is not as common as we think. Why? Because the foundation, again, is not stable, right? And things end up collapsing. The way we fix it and the way we reinforce our roots is by having a muna and by having bitachon and akadosh baruchu. We have to go back to our roots and remember where we came from. We're in times of extreme, extreme testing and challenges, and I don't think you have to be religious to understand that. I mean, we see we see this tragedy after tragedy. Everyone's going through hard times. There's not one home that's happy and stable and constant, right? We're we're getting challenged so many times and everyone's going through different things. And it doesn't mean that we need to panic because you're all doing the right thing by being here and trying to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So, Baruch Hashem, you know, you have faith and, and you have that belief that things will get better and you wanna work on yourselves. But it also means that we don't have time for baby steps, right? So, you know, I'll, I'll keep Shabbat maybe in three months, you know, when I'm ready. I'll, I'll cover my hair when I'm ready. I'll send my kids to a Jewish school when I'm ready, right? So everybody has their things that they need to work on, but it's so difficult that there's nothing that can push us really. So we just say, yeah, 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 later, 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 right? But then when are we ever ready? We're never ready to take that next step. We're never ready to give ourselves limitations, to give ourselves rules because it's hard. It's hard. That's the whole idea behind Amuna and Bitachon and Hashem because sometimes it's too hard. And we're like, yeah, I have faith in Hashem, but to a certain point. So there are two ways we evaluate beliefs and our relationship with Hashem. So we said emunah and bitachon. Emunah is having faith in Hashem, believing that Hashem exists, believing in, in Shabbat, believing in Kashrut, believing in Nida. You, you believe in Hashem that He exists and that there is a God, but it doesn't go beyond that. Bitachon is having trust in Hashem. So emunah is faith, but bitachon is trusting. It's not the same thing. It's trusting that Hashem does everything for a reason. Not the reason that you think is a good reason for you or the reason that you want, but just because Hashem has His reasons. That's trusting Him 100%. Emunah is the intellectual knowledge of Hashem and His ways, meaning that we know Hashem exists, we know that we should be keeping Shabbat, we hold everything to be true and we believe and it's logical, it makes sense, for example, when we spoke about in my in in I think it was two years ago that we spoke about kashrut, and I said it makes sense, it's so beautiful, and you know, and people believe they have a that this is the right way, right? But bitachon is an emotional internalization of that knowledge. It's very important to know the difference because bitachon is not a logical thing; it's emotional. I'm going to give you an example. I love this example. 
when a child goes to a pediatrician, he goes with his mother, he's all happy and excited, he sees toys in the waiting room, he's playing around, and then he sees the doctor come in with a white coat, and he starts freaking out because he knows he's about to get stabbed by this doctor, right? He's getting a vaccine. So what happens? He says, no way, my mother's not gonna do that to me. She loves me, she nurtures me, she plays with me, she feeds me, there's no way she's gonna let this doctor do this to me, right? And what does the mother do? Because the baby's crying and he's not letting the doctor move his shirt, she forces him on the table and she lets the doctor inject him with the vaccine. The baby is crying, screaming, the mother is still doing the same thing, right? What's going on in the baby's mind or in the toddler's mind? She's horrible, how could she do this to me? She only wants the best for me, I'm literally in the worst pain of my life, what's going on? And the funny part is that after the shot, what does the baby do? He goes fast back to his mom and he hugs his mom. Didn't your mom just collaborate with the monster that just stabbed you? How does that make sense? Like how do you go back to your mom after you just went through the worst pain in your, in your mental capacity, that's what you think is the worst pain, right? You think it's the worst thing that ever happened to you, but you still go back to your mom. And why that is, is because the child has the emotional internalization that the mother is his support no matter what. No matter what pain he's in, no matter what challenge he's in, the mother's always gonna be there. Even though it seems for the moment that he's in the worst pain, he doesn't know that that stabbing is actually saving his life. And how are you gonna explain that to a baby? You can't, they don't have the mental capacity to understand. But at the end of the day, the mother's doing the right thing. And for the baby, it doesn't seem like that. In the same way, someone who has real trust and bitachon in Hashem, he has unconditional trust for Hashem. And even though he has, he's going through pain and he's going through a lot of challenges in life, he still goes back to Hashem because he needs the support and he knows that Hashem is the main nurturer and the central part of his life and that they'll always that he will always be there no matter what that is the emotional emotional internalization such a hard word to say that comes from bitachon even though you're angry with hashem you still go back over and over and over Growing up also, a child never worries, you know, when they wake up in the morning and they eat their cereal, they're not worrying about, mom, how are we going to pay for the next cereal? How are we going to pay for the next bill? They're not even thinking that. They're thinking like, what toy am I going to pick up from the playground, right? The mother and the father are worrying about how do we pay, which school do they go to, uh, what kids are they hanging out with? The kid is not thinking about all those things, right? The children don't worry about that because all that's in their head is let's play, let's have play dates. I'm gonna have an amazing dinner tonight because they rely unconditionally and instinctually on their parents, right? They have zero worries. That's how bitachon works. Bitachon works in a way where you have zero worries about what's gonna happen in the next hour, what's gonna happen in the next month, what's gonna happen in the next year. You're like that child because you know that you're going to be nurtured by Hashem no matter what and that you have zero worries no matter what. So this was part one. This was the difference between Emuna and Bitachon. When I visited Poland in the March of the Living a few years ago, I met a Holocaust survivor. His name was Marty. He was the cutest individual ever. He was amazing. I think you, do, were you with me in the March of the Living? Uh, you were with me, okay. Um, so I met this Holocaust survivor and when he was speaking about the camps, he spoke about his survival in Camp Majdanek, which for me, I visited all the camps, you know, in, in Poland, and it was wor the Warsaw Ghetto, and among others. But to me, Majdanek was the worst thing there possibly could be. I don't know why that really hit home for me. It was the hardest for me to see. And he survived that specific ghetto. And he said that later on, after his liberation, he ended up creating a family, and he had two sons with his wife. And a few years later, his son passed away from cancer. And I look at him and he's wearing kippah and he's wearing kittit and walking around in Kat Maidanik, showing me his initials on his bunk bed, showing me where, you know, where the gas chambers were. And he's walking around with a kippah and he's talking about how he still believes in Hashem. That was one of the most unbelievable experiences for me because I said, how can he possibly 
have witnessed, number one, the grieving of his son and have witnessed thousands of people dying in crematoriums and being tortured. And he still says Hashem exists and he has his reasons. He was the only person until today that had 100% bitachon in Hashem. Till today, I haven't met one person that has real bitachon in Hashem because that's how difficult it is. There's another story of a rabbi who goes to a yard site of, um, of a Holocaust survivor, but essentially his uncle was also a Holocaust survivor, and he told him, can you please do, do a shiul for me during this yard site? It's my wife. It was his aunt. And he said, I really don't like doing shulim, doing yard site, because, you know, you want to just talk about the person. Nobody wants to hear shulim. Like, you know, it's quick. You light a candle. You talk about the individual. You make a few bachot, and you go home. You know, nobody wants to sit through a lecture. He said, please, Rabbi, you're really so inspirational. I really, really, you know, want you to. And so this rabbi, when he explained the story, he said that it was my uncle, so I couldn't say no. So he said, I'm going to give a speech, but it's going to be two minutes long. And what he said in the speech was this. Usually when a person passes away, you talk about their qualities. And he says, she had so many qualities that I, I can't, I would spend hours trying to cover all the qualities that she had. But she had one quality that surpassed all the qualities that I can ever talk about. And that was the quality that she was a Holocaust survivor and she had bitachon in Hashem. And he said, and that's all I have to say about her because that's all you need to know. She was an unbelievable person that just had this unconditional love and trust in Hashem that is very, very difficult to have. When we look at bitachon, we see that it comes down to the gut feeling that Hashem is with us no matter what, despite what tragedy, despite what circumstance. It's a gut and emotional feeling. That's why it's so hard to attain it, right? Because a lot of people have emunah and they believe it to a certain extent. But bitachon, trusting in Hashem unconditionally, like the child after the vaccine, is very, very difficult. When we pray to Hashem for salvation and we say, Hashem, save me from this tragedy, save me from going through this, save me from this challenge, but we don't really believe that he's capable for whatever reason, then how could Hashem really respond to us? He says, you don't trust me 100%. I know it. I feel it, right? So he says, okay, you're get, trying to get close to me, but it's kind of like fake it till you make it. You know, you're lighting candles, you're praying, you're like, Hashem, help us, but you don't really believe it deep down, right? Because there's that lack of emunah, the lack of the foundation that we build with Hashem, the lack of relationship that we have with, with Hashem that makes us doubt his ways. And Hashem gives us a choice. Do we trust Him or do we doubt Him? It's very hard, it's a hard choice. Hashem is capable of anything, anything in the whole world. I don't think you, it, it's, it's very hard to understand because sometimes we, we live by logic and then when miracles happen, we're like, it was literally impossible. But when we look at those miracles, we see it is possible. Hashem wants you to reach out to Him and believe that nothing is out of what He can do. Nothing goes out of the box. Everything you can imagine is possible for Hashem. It's just the fact that we need to believe that that can happen. Like I mentioned, bitachon is the hardest, hardest mitzvah in the whole Torah because everything that we do goes against our bitachon. I'm going to give you an example. When you pray for parnasah, you pray to Hashem, but you don't just sit there and you're like, Hashem, please give me a million dollars. You go out there and you have a nine to five because you have to feed kids at home, right? So it contradicts bitachon because in one end, you know that no matter what, in one hour, two hours, I trust Hashem, whatever He does, it's for me. But then on the other end, you have to do your ishtadlut and you have to work the nine to five. So you come home and then you get a paycheck at the end of the month. And what does that say about you? I did this with my bare hands. Where is Hashem in this picture? I work for my money. Right? So then you have a Muna, yeah, Hashem exists, yeah, you know, Hashem gave me, you know, um, the Torah and I follow it and I do Shabbat and Kashrut, but when I pray for Panasah, it really comes from me. I go out and get the money, right? So where does Bitachon come in in this? But when you have an emotional attachment to Hashem, even if you work for your panasa and you work for other things, when you pray to Hashem, you know that really deep down it comes from Him. It's like the other day my husband got um, like an award or a promotion or I don't know what it was exactly that they were speaking on the group chat and they said, Kol and I said, babe, I'm so proud of you. And he said, it wasn't me. 
it was Hashem who gave me the right tools, and now, you know, this is why, you know, oh, Hashem, I'm doing well. I was like, of course he would say that. I'm like, no, but like, you did, you did really well. You worked really hard. And he said, it's all Hashem. Don't even start talking about me. You know, he's very into like, everything comes from Hashem, everything, everything. That's not just Hemuna. It comes from the God. You feel that Hashem is with you every single step of the way. So I want to ask you, if, so, if you're at the gas station right now and a stranger comes to you and says, I need to borrow $40, I'm so sorry, I really like, I, I, I don't have money on me, I really need $40. So, I mean, to most people, I hope $40 is okay. You know, you'll give it to him, you won't think twice, okay, I did a mitzvah, tzedakah, no problem. But in the same scenario, if somebody comes and says, I need $80, so now, it's almost a hundred bucks. Like you're gonna think twice, you know, $80 is a lot. Like what's your name? Where do you live? You know, you wanna know that he'll be able to pay you back. But why is it that the $40 was nothing, you didn't even think about it, and the 80 is something a little harder to give? Why? Because the challenge is, is bigger. You have more to lose, right? It's harder to give $80 than $40. Unless you're a millionaire, obviously. If that same person comes to you and says, I need to borrow $500, a stranger. I mean, I don't know how generous you are, but generally speaking, I, I think people will whip out contracts and be like, what's your name? What's your address? You need to bring it to me. You know, you need to pay me back in a month. You know, you're gonna start asking questions. Why? Because $500 is a lot. The harder the challenges we have in life, the harder it is to have bitachon in Hashem and to trust Him. Because 40 bucks, yeah, I'll do it. I'll say modani in the morning. What does it take, 12 seconds? But when it comes to doing all of Shabbat, I'm not willing to give $500. That's too much for me. You know, what, are, what am I getting in return here, right? Am I gonna get paid back? So we have emuna, yeah, we have emuna, but it comes with a certain extent. Right? There's a, we draw the line. Every single one of you has a line that's drawn here. Right? You're not willing to sacrifice X amount of money. You're not willing to sacrifice covering your hair because you just you look too good with your hair. You can't do it. You can't give Hashem that satisfaction, unfortunately. Right? It's too hard. It's too hard to give the $500. On another note, we talk about emuna, when we talk about emuna and bitachon, we have to make something very clear. There is nothing in the world, nothing that I've witnessed that's more unifying than when there's a tragedy that strikes. It's the most unfortunate thing in the world, but that's the reality. Because what happens when there's a tragedy? It strips away the layers and it makes you vulnerable. You feel this like need to help out. You, you, you feel this empathy and this need to help out the Jewish people. You have this love for them. And in the Torah it says, Kol Israel, Arevim, Zelazel, we're all responsible for each other. We feel each other's pain no matter what. Even though we don't think so, we do. There's nothing that gets us closer to Hashem than challenges we feel we can't surpass. Why? Because when we have challenges that are bigger than us, then we have to address the individual that's bigger than us, which is Hashem, because nobody else in the world can help you but Hashem. He's in control of everything. So how are you going to surpass those challenges if not handle it with Hashem, if not pray to Hashem and say, this is way bigger than me, this is too hard, I can't handle it by myself. There's nothing that pushes us more to do mitzvot and transform than when we're forced to. All the organizations that I know, every single one, stemmed from tragedy or the loss of a loved one or something that happened that sparked them to make a change to push them out of their comfort zone somebody lost a, uh, uh, an individual to cancer they do a cancer organization somebody lost a person from ALS or whatever it is and they started an organization why because they had that feel for unity they had so much pain that they had to transform it into something that's bigger than themselves. And so when tragedy hits, this is where we unite the most. You can see it now, more than ever. I've never, I, I tried to enter the WhatsApp group for the collapse. There was 5,000 
people in the WhatsApp group and they said, we can't, you can't even enter the chat because there were so many people that were like, I need to help. They even told people, do not come unless you fill out a volunteer form because there's so many people in Surfside right now wanting to help the families and wanting to help. I told my friend the other day, I said, I just want to like grab a shovel and like take the rubble out and, and, and just help. I, I didn't know what to do. I felt so useless, you know. Everybody goes and helps when it comes to those tragic things because we all feel the unity that nothing else in the world can make us better and stronger than through those tragic events. This happens because it pushes us to go out of our comfort zone and to see what there is. Because if everything was normal and we're in our routine, then what do we do? We go in the morning to work, we come back, Netflix and chill, let's go shopping, let's go for drinks with a friend. Everything goes back to normal. So the only thing that can make us grow is when something wakes us up and we're like, oh my God, what just happened? Oh my God, this was a Jewish family. Oh my God, the Jewish nation is going through so much. I have to do something, right? Why is it that it's only tragedy that wakes us up? When I was living in Israel, um, actually it was right before I moved to Israel, but there was the war of Tsukitan and they needed volunteers at the mall to send things to the, to the soldiers, to the Chaylin. And so I stood there with a table and there was like a few other volunteers with me. And you see like <laughs> grandmas like pushing carts with like all the things that the soldiers needed. So socks, cigarettes, you know, whatever you can think of, you know, the grandmas are like, tikri, tikri, you know, they need this, they need this. And I'm like, there's things that they really didn't need, but they just like threw it in there. And you saw the unity that they were like, Ay, like I can't believe it. You know, like they were so, there was such unity in Israel. I, I've never seen that in my whole life. It was unbelievable. There was actually also letters that you could send to soldiers and you see like every letter was like, call me and people put their number. <laughs> I was like, they're literally in the middle of a war. Like you do get that. <laughs> um, when things are good and our lives are balanced, we tend to pay less attention to Hashem because we see that things are in our control and that we don't really need Him right now. You know, like things are good. I'm not speaking for everyone, obviously, but you know, most of us, we, we tend to forget him a little bit because we don't really need him. We, we don't have things that are bigger than, our, than ourselves going on. Sometimes we're not dealing with the craziest challenges and we're like, yeah, we can handle it ourselves. So we don't need prayer. We don't need to take on mitzvot, right? We put Hashem to the side a little bit. And then Hashem says, I got to wake you up somehow. So this is what I need to do. There's a letter written by Eli Wiesel. I'm sure you guys heard of him, but he's one of my favorite authors. He was a Holocaust survivor. He wrote a few books, I think it was Dawn Knight, and there was a few other ones. Highly recommended to read, but he spoke about his experience in the Shoah. But more than that, he spoke about his relationship with Hashem and how angry he was at what was going on, right? 50 years after his liberation, it's unbelievable how Hashem sent me to this letter because I never heard of it, and it was like, I guess he wanted me to speak about it. But he, but I figure I found that he wrote a letter to Hashem 50 years after he was liberated. I'm going to read you a short part of the letter because it was a little long and I don't want to, you know, cover everything. But this is essentially what he says. This is the middle of the letter, not the beginning. What about my faith in you, master of the universe? I now realize I never lost it, not even over there during the darkest hours of my life. I don't know why I kept on whispering my daily prayers. And those who reserved and those reserved for the Sabbath and for the holidays, but I did recite them, often with my father, and on Rosh Hashanah Eve with hundreds of inmates at Auschwitz. Was it because the prayers remained a link to the vanished world of my childhood? But my faith was no longer pure. How could it be? It was filled with anguish rather than fervor, with perplexity more than piety. In the kingdom of eternal night, on the days of awe, which are the days of judgment on Yom Kippur, my traditional prayers were directed to you as well as against you. Master of the universe, what hurt me more, your absence or your silence? In my testimony, I have written harsh words, burning words about your role in our tragedy. This is what he wrote in his books. I would not repeat them today, but I felt them then 
I felt them in every cell of my being. Why did you allow, if not enable, the killer day after night to torment, kill, and annihilate thousands of Jewish children? Why were they abandoned by your creation? These thoughts were in no way destined to diminish the guilt of the guilty. Their established culpability is irrelevant to my problem with you. In my childhood, I did not expect much from human beings, but I expected everything from you. Where were you, God of kindness in Auschwitz? What was going on in heaven at the celestial tribunal, the courts of heaven? While your children were marked for humiliation, isolation, and death, only because they were Jewish. These questions have been haunting me for more than five decades. You have vocal defenders, you know. Many theological answers were given to me, such as, God is God. He alone knows what he's doing. One has no right to question him. Or, Auschwitz was a punishment for European Jewish sins of assimilation and Zionism. And, isn't Israel the solution? Without Auschwitz, there would have been no Israel. I reject all these answers. Auschwitz must and will forever remain a question mark only. It can be conceived neither with God nor without God. At one point, I began wondering whether I was not unfair with you. After all, Auschwitz was not something that came down ready-made from heaven. It was conceived by men, implemented by men, staffed by men. And their aim was to destroy not only us, but you as well. Ought we not to think of your pain too? Watching your children suffer at the hands of your other children, haven't you also suffered? As we Jews now enter the high holidays again, preparing ourselves to pray for a year <coughs> of peace and happiness for our people and all people, let us make up. In spite of everything that happened, yes, in spite, let us make up. For the child in me, it is unbearable to be divorced from you for so long. Like a child after his immunization, it's unbearable to leave your creator, the person that nurtures you, the person that's always there. From the start, it was unbearable for him for five decades to be with Hashem. He said, I don't care, whatever I live through, I, I need that connection again. He said, I've been divorced for you for so long, I know more, I need to make up with you. Here's an example of someone who went through one of the biggest tragedies in history of humankind. And he still mentions that he can no longer bear the fact that he's been so far from Hashem. He can't continue living without Amuna. We have to understand whether religious or not, faithful or not, we have to believe in something to help us get through difficulties and challenges in life. If we can't believe in something bigger than ourselves, then life becomes even more difficult to bear because then it's in our control. And then what do we do? We worry, we have anxiety, we have depression. Who's gonna help us? We need emuna to get through our challenges. It's that simple. No matter how angry you are, no matter how sad you are, no matter how tragic things are, we still depend on Hashem because we still need emuna. That's just how we're built. During the Spanish Inquisition, there were people being forced to renounce their, their faith, the Jewish people. And there were a lot of people who they were assimilating with the non-Jews, they weren't religious at all, and they didn't even associate with Judaism. And when they came for them, they said, renounce your faith or we kill you. They said, okay, kill me. They said, kill me. And I said, how is that possible? They don't associate with Judaism. They never did Shabbat in their life. They don't even go pray on Yom Kippur. And they said, I would rather die than renounce my faith. Why? No matter how religious we are and how far we are from Hashem, Hashem created us, but Selem Elohim. What does that mean? He created us in the light of Hashem. There's a part of us that is godly, that Hashem said, you're not going to forget me ever. You're always going to love me no matter what. And that part comes out in the worst of tragedies. It comes out when it's life or death. Because at the end of the day, people who are not religious, if it comes to life or death situations, they're going to grab their hand and say, Shema Yisrael. And they're going to call out to Hashem. We are connected to Hashem in ways we can't even imagine. And we haven't 
really experienced that yet because we, we haven't peeled off the layers that make us vulnerable, right? Hopefully we, we won't go through tragedies that you know make us fall into that category, but that's what happens when tragedy hits. Even if you're angry and you're sad and you're spiteful and you're grieving, when you peel off those layers, you'll find that you need Hashem no matter what. So we can be angry at Hashem when tragedy strikes and continue living without forgiving. Or we can work on our true bitachon and say, I don't understand your reasons for my suffering. I don't understand why my mother is allowing this doctor to stab me. But I'm still going to hold on to you because I need to. I need to to get through this life. We need Hashem in every aspect of our lives because look at the world without religion. Right? There's no prayer, you're living without boundaries, there's no hope, and so we become average. And we're not meant to be average, right? We're meant to be pushed out of our comfort zone, we're meant to maximize our potential. And how do we do that? By connecting with Hashem and seeing how we can get better every single day. Last but not least, there are times in life like this one where people who have suffered loss and enter the stages of grief will go to the biggest rabbis to find answers. Today you can't go and talk to a grieving family, especially with what's going on. They're, they don't care about what you have to say, no matter how big of a rabbi you are. When someone is suffering so much, parents who lose children, children who lose parents, widows, the loss of loved ones, when they're asking, why did this happen? They're not looking for answers. Because no matter what answer you give them, no matter how smart, how logical, how spiritual, nothing in the world can justify a loss. Even if Hashem comes to a grieving mother and He says, this is why your child was taken. And He shows her an image of her son or her daughter up there and He says, look, he's having the best time, he's in heaven with all the tzaddikim, what is she gonna say to Hashem? But why? Why did you take him from me? Not because she was looking for an answer, because Hashem is right there telling her, but because it's too hard for her to bear. She just wants her son, she doesn't want answers. She wants the pain to stop, because she's in this world and they're in the next, right? She doesn't care about the answers. It's not what she's looking for. The question of why when a tragedy strikes it's not an inquisitive question, it's an emotional aspect. It hurts too much to bear. They just want their loved ones. The mother is not looking for explanations. She's looking for her child. She misses him, it hurts her. So when a religious leader comes to justify Hashem, to make Hashem look good, and to make him look you know, good and so that people can go back to the religion, but he still leaves her with all the pain, even though it was a good answer, then what's the point? It doesn't change the fact that she's in pain right now, right? And so grieving families can go around the world asking the biggest rabbis, but they'll realize that they're not looking for answers. They just want the pain to stop. So, I wanna end, of course, with the toolbox as usual because especially with Amunah and Bitachon it's very hard to apply it in real life because sometimes we just forget you know when we continue our lives and you know this was maybe just a shield and it was enlightening but it doesn't push us to do anything so number one Amunah comes first right so I said it, there's no time for baby steps but with Amunah it, you need to take it slow right it's, it's hard to to build Bitachon so quickly you have to start with Amunah which is the, the first aspect Start with the basics, build a connection with Hashem, pray to Him. That is how you build true emunah. I say this in every class and I'll say it again. There is no such thing as a powerful prayer if it doesn't follow action. You know, when you say Hashem, give me shalom bayit, or when you tell Hashem, you know, Bezat Hashem, I want to get pregnant, or whatever it is that you ask for Hashem, you know, to help you with those challenges, if you just open the book, say a prayer, and close the book and continue with your day, then it's, it could be a prayer, but it's not a powerful one. It needs to be followed by action, because then you're saying, Hashem, give me shalom bayit, here's how I'm working on myself. 
that's when Hashem says, okay, she's meeting me halfway. Always follow prayer with action. Take something upon yourself. Whatever it is, especially the hard mitzvot, that's where Hashem comes through, right? Prayer needs to be followed by action. This is my favorite. My husband gave me this one. Document and keep a journal of every worry that you've had and how it came out. Usually most of those outcomes were positive because you grew from it. Right? If you keep a journal of that, even the biggest and the hardest challenges that you've had and you're living here today and everything is fine, then you look back at that journal when you're worried and you don't have a muna and you're stressed and you say, okay, Hashem came through, Hashem came through, Hashem was here, Hashem was here, Hashem was here. And that's when, number one, it becomes easier because you're like, okay, in retrospect, everything ended up being fine. But number two, you recognize Hashem in everything that happened throughout the years. Accept also that we will never understand and know Hashem's ways because we have We don't have the men mental capacity to understand just like a child You know who gets vaccinated and he's in so much pain and he doesn't understand why his mother is doing this to him But he still goes back to her in the same way. We don't have the mental capacity to understand Hashem's ways If we seek to understand Hashem's ways we're doomed to be even more angry and upset because we're just not able to understand, right? And so we're going to, you know, go to rabbis and try to understand and go dig in the Gemara and the Kabbalah and whatever it is. But at the end of the day, we're doomed because Hashem says, like He said to Moshe, you cannot see my presence and live. You cannot live in this world with this mental capacity and understand really what's going on. We don't know what the world to come has. We don't know if the victims up there right now are, you know, looking down and saying, oh, they're really suffering out there. We don't know anything. We don't know what's going on. And so it's really, really important that when it comes to Muna and we question Hashem and that we're angry and we're grieving, that we take a step back and we say, it's, we're doomed if, if we're going to try and find answers because we, we might not have them. Before I end the shoe, I want to take a moment to pray for the lives of the, of the Surfside Collapse that were taken, but even more so to pray for good news, to find the victims alive, to strengthen our emunah and Hashem because He decides every single outcome. I don't care how difficult the tragedy is, there are people that can still come out of there alive and we just really need to believe in it, not just pray for it, we have to believe. They're gonna come out of there, we have to. Because that's true bitachon, right? That's what we're trying to build here. I printed these out, I'm gonna hand them out. It's Nishmat Kol Chai, which is an extremely powerful prayer. If you haven't heard of it, it's a segula. If you do it, if you do it 40 days consecutively, you can ask for pretty much anything, and Bezal Hashem Hashem will give it to you. It's very, very powerful. But even more so, it's a segula for strengthening our emuna and our bitachon and Hashem. So we're gonna do it together. You can read it with me, or quietly, or just listen to the prayer, and you can just say Amen at the end. Um, so I think we're gonna well. Oh, let me just take one second. Read it. Um, if you, I didn't print it out in English. I completely forgot. So if you guys can't read in Hebrew, you could just follow with me and then just say Amen at the end. Um, if you guys on Zoom, you can pull it up online. Just type in Nishmat Kol Chai. We're going to do it together now. an English one for you and I forgot. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna send you the English one. It's very hard to find. That's why I couldn't find one. So I'll, I'll find you one. So I think because some people can't read the Hebrew, I'm gonna read it out loud and then you guys can just say Amen and follow here. Be nice. Yeah, but usually if you do it consecutively, you wanna do it at the same time. Because if you miss a day after sunset, it could consider the next day. That's why. Does everyone have one? You might give it to everyone here? Okay guys, so I need you to be absolutely quiet and silent. Really think about the victims because prayer is extremely powerful, especially this one. 
It's extremely critical that you guys say amen at the end. Every single amen counts. It's very, very important. So I'm going to start. <clears throat> נשמת כל חי תברך את שמך אדוני אלינו ורוח כל בשר תפאר אותו רומם זכרך מלכנו תמיד מן העולם ועד העולם אתה אל ומבלעדיך אין אנו מלך כהל ומשיע פודה ומציל ועונה ומרחם בכל עת צרה וצוקה אין אנו מלך עוזר ושמח אלא אתה אלוהי הראשונים והאחרונים אלוה כל בריות אדון כל תולדות המהולל בכל התשפחות המנהג עולמו בחסד ובריאותיו ברחמים ואדוני אלוהים אמת לא ינום ולא ישן המעורר ישנים והמקיף נרדמים מחיה מתים ורופא חולים, פוקח עיוורים וזוקף כפופים, המסיח אילמים והמפענח נעלמים, ולך לאותך אנחנו מודים, ואילו פינו מלא שירה קיים, ולשוננו רינה כהמון גלה, ושפתותינו שבח כמרחבי רקיע, ועינינו מאירות כשמש וכירח, וידינו פרוסות כנשרי שמיים, ורגלינו כלות כאיילות, אין אנחנו מספיקים להודות לך, אדוני אלוהינו, לברך את שמך מלכנו. על אחת מאלף אלפי אלפים, ורוב ריבי רבבות פעמים הטובות ניסים ונפלאות שעשית עמנו ועם אבותינו מלפנים ממצרים גאלתנו אדוני אלוהינו מבית עבדים, עבדים תליתנו ברעב זנתנו ובשבע קלקלתנו מחרב הצלתנו מדבר מילטנו מחלאים רעים ורבים דיליתנו עד הנה עזרונו רחמך ולא עזבונו חסדך על כן הדברים שפילגת בנו ורוח ונשמה שנפכת באפנו ולשון אשר שמת בפינו הן הם יודו ויברכו וישבחו ויפארו את שמך מלכנו תמיד כי כל פה לך יודה, וכל לשון לך תשבח, וכל עין לך תצפה, וכל ברך לך תכרע, וכל קומה לפניך תשתחווה, והלבבות יראוך והקרב והכליות יזמרו לשבחך, כדבר שנאמר. כל עצמותי תאמרנה, אדוני, מי כמוך מציל אני מחזק ממנו, ואני ואביון מגוזלו. שבת אני אם אתה תשמע, צעקת הדל תקשיב ותושיע, וכתוב רננו צדיקים באדוני לישרים לאהבת תהילה. בפי ישרים תתרומם, ובשפתי צדיקים תתברך, ובלשון חסידים תתקדש, ובקרב קדושים תתעלל. ומכלות רבות עמך בית ישראל, שכן חובת כל היצורים לפניך, אדוני אלוהינו ואלוהי אבותינו, להודות, להלל, לשבח, לפאר, לרומם, להדר, ולנצח על כל דברי שירות ותשבחות, דוד בן ישי, עבדיך משיחיך. ובכן, השתבח שמך לעד מלכנו, האל המלך הגדול והקדוש בשמיים ובארץ. כי לך נאה אדוני אלוהינו ואלוהי אבותינו לעולם ועד, שיר ושבחה, הלל וזמרה, עוז וממשלה, נצח כדולה וגבורה, תהילה ותפארת קדושה ומלכות. ברכות והודעות לשמך הגדול הקדוש, ומעולם ועד עולם אתה אל, ברוך אתה מלך גדול ומהולל בתשבחות. אל ההודעות אדון הנפלאות, בורא כל הנשמות, ריבון כל המעשים, הבוחר בשירי זמרה, מלך אל חי העולמים, אמן. The next thing we're going to do, and this is a very important um, thing, I usually do this at home and I usually dim the lights, so I'm just going to put, um, I'm going to put music, and we're just going to close our eyes, take a moment of silence, talk to Hashem, pray to Hashem, whatever you're going through. Very, very important to take moments in the day to recognize Him, number one, and say, hey, I want to build a relationship with you. It doesn't have to be in a sidur, it doesn't have to be Hebrew words when you can't read sometimes, it's too hard. You just take a moment and you close your eyes because that's when you can concentrate the most. And we're going to do a few prayers. I don't know where my phone is, I just want to connect it to my, uh, oh I think it's here. I'm going to put some music. And unfortunately we can't dim the lights for some reason. I usually do, so just if it works. Thank you. 
hopefully that was powerful for you as much as it was for me. So Bezat Hashem, good news, hopefully in honor of the, the victims and their families, you know, Bezat Hashem, this tefillah and this unity and the achdut of everybody here will see only good news and that the families, Bezat Hashem, will get good news. Amen. We're really just, if anybody's watching here, we're with you guys every step of the way and, and we're all hurting. We're really haven't slept in, in days because I can't even imagine the pain that they're going through. But prayer is everything. Taking the time to really speak to Hashem. I use music because it really makes me emotional and, and it gets that vulnerability out there. And you can too. Of course, I can send you a playlist. Um, take the time to connect with Hashem. It's all He wants. 